a myth like the uh, the girl at the drugstore, which probably most Long of you term. don't know what that <laughs> means anymore, but that, that you could, you know, just get discovered and become a movie star. Um, <laughs> having a play come in over the transom from a playwright that you don't know, that you've never heard of, that, you know, in a theater where you're reading five to eight hundred plays a year, that you're going to find that one and go, oh my god, I have got to do this play. It just doesn't really work like that. How many pieces are you looking at at a year, in a year versus how many you're actually going to produce? We produce six on two different stages, and we, we take, we, we, we process, read, uh, probably around 750 scripts a year. Um, so your odds are slim if, if you're coming in over the transom. And the fact of the matter is, I mean, I think, uh, there is a lot of conversation about whether open submission policies are really the best policy. And, um, you know, I think that people preserve them in order to preserve the notion that something could come in over the transom and that you never know what you're going to find and you never know who's going to kind of rise to the top of the heap. But when you're dealing, you know, one of the flaws in that system is that when you're dealing with that many scripts, you are dispersing those scripts to a lot of different people to read in order to get them attended to in a reasonably timely fashion. Um, and so you're, you, you know, and that group of people tends to change a lot because most often you're not paying some of those people. There are interns and there are volunteer readers and sometimes paid readers. Um, but you're having to base your judgments on scripts also on the subjective points of view of people who come and go a little bit and who, you know, are, um, whose, whose taste you have to get to know over time, ideally, but sometimes they're not around long enough to really make sense of that. Right. So there's a, lot of fa there's a lot of ways in which it's hard for the, even the best material that comes in over the transom to kind of work its way up the food chain sometimes. Um, because, you know, for example, with the job like I have, I, a lot of my day is really spent producing the work that we're doing all night, um, or working with commission writers on plays that we've actually asked for. So I I don't have I couldn't possibly read some of them in plays in the air right. or what I want to but um, I, I you know so when I look at the stuff that's coming in whether it's through a, a sort of a general submission or an agent or, or whatever I tend to call from the top I call from the things that I I think already I have some predisposition to think are going to be interesting right uh, so you know it it is, it, it is the, the submission system that exists in most theaters, whether it's a fully open system or a, um, or a somewhat closed or somewhat um, bracketed somehow um, process, it's, a, it's inherently flawed. And it's a, right. it's a big problem, both for theaters, because you spend a lot of time on it, um, which might be spent in some ways um, better spent with a fewer number of artists, I would argue. But it's also often, it's very frustrating and limiting to writers because presumably there are things that should be put to the top of the job. That don't need to do it. Yeah. John, you got you probably have a little bit of a different process than other people on the panel. Talk about because you guys do take over Yeah, the time um, we 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 probably have a, a a more fortunate system in that because because most of what we're reading for City Theater is eight, nine, ten, eleven minutes. I can afford, or, or uh, Susie can afford to look at what comes through the trend, and we do. Um, <laughs> I, a very large percentage of the plays that have been produced in the couple years I've been here have come from open submissions. Frankly, if I was reading 90 page scripts, that number would go way down for the same reason. Right. Uh, but we're fortunate in that way that we are able to kind of take the time and look at them. So. Right. John, as a commercial producer, how does that, how do works come to you? Um, most of the time, plays come to me through agents. Um, and frankly, I rarely take an unsolicited submission now, which I only, I, I mean, I really started doing just about 10 years ago. I was working um, at the uh, Carsey Werner television studio, and for legal reasons, we were not allowed to take um, unsolicited uh, submissions. Right. And I, for the first time, I understood the value of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, for the
for the most part, incorporated that into my own personal business mode. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, some, sometimes I'll read something by somebody who's uh, you know recommended to me, but um, a lot of times I ju I feel like I'm bombarded. Now I'm not running a big company with a lot of people, and um, when I say I'm going to read a script, I actually am the one who reads the script, um, and I'm a very slow reader, <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's very challenging, and I take it seriously, and I really do pour over it. That said, if I'm reading a script and in 10, 15, 20 pages I'm not engaged, I often put it down. You can walk away. Yeah. How about at San Francisco? You know, I, don't, I know the process of let's produce a play and then get it published. Is Do you always take things only that have been produced? How does it work? Um, no. Well, the, there's no hard and fast rule about it, uh, but statistically, if you look at what we publish and, and then productions, it's most often, yes, they have been produced before. And, and even more to that, there is some commercial momentum behind the piece. Uh, you know, because we're a licensor of work, the idea is that there is kind of a licensing demand for the play, and that there are theaters around the country that have heard about the play, you know, and, and want to put it up at their theaters, or, you know, in, in the rare case that we do go ahead with something that maybe came across our desk or we found randomly, there's a very, very specific target market. Um, for example, I just heard from a person at a conference that uh, high school teachers want to play and it's like Twilight. So it's something, <laughs> came across, something came across my desk that was about Start writing those vampires. <laughs> 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 Do it now. We're here. Roma fans. Everybody can take it. You are. But, um, you know, there are those rare cases, I think, with us. I mean, we get anywhere from, we, we don't take full length plays. We take, right now, it's, well, right now, submissions have been closed for a year just because we're doing some kind of internal remodeling. But um, normally, we take a query letter and 10 pages, and then a production history, a lot of you know, hard and fast info about the play. And kind of from there, we can make a decision as to whether or not it's the appropriate time, or if it's something we need. Or There's a lot of other considerations for publishers just because you know, our catalog is um, 3,500 active titles. So in addition to if there is a commercial demand, there's, we also have to factor in um, kind of what our customers are asking for, what else we published that year, what's coming down the pipeline. So it's, it's a lot that weighs into that decision. Mm -hmm. Ricky, what's your um, submission policy at NIMP? We have an open submission policy, but uh, it's incredibly tough because uh, Chris said it, I mean, to get staff to respond, the response time and stuff. Right. As Stephen Chambers, our literary manager, I mean, he's pro bono. So it's at his own pace, and then he, he filters them to me, and I, I, I am a quick reader, so I read them really fast. And I do know in the ten, first 10 pages or 12, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm if it's gonna capture mm -hmm. what I'm about. But, and then we take, we, we're, since we're part of the National Movie Play Network, we have definite different ways to, to get to see new work. We have showcases that we go to. Uh, we see six different pieces, uh, if not seven or eight, and then, um, they, the, the, our, our sister theater companies all relate work that might be similar to our mission or that, that it's my taste that kind of way as well and, and we get a lot of agent submission as well. I usually read the ones that come from NMPN first. Mm -hmm. Because then, you know, it's kind of a filter yeah. already. That, that we, I, they know me, they, I know them, and it's, uh, we, have, we share a, a same vocabulary. If you're not familiar, National New Play Network is a, an organization of about 30 theaters, all of whom have a real mission to produce new work, and that could be anything from a couple of year plus a festival up through well, the Florida State Scholar. They were, I think we were the only ones doing exclusively new work. Mm -hmm. But new work being um, first, second, and third productions. National New Play Network is the organization that created the uh, Continued Life of New Plays Fund that you're probably familiar with, where three artistic directors agree to produce a play within a one year period so that a playwright gets three uh, entirely separate productions with completely separate artistic teams in three different cities in what could be everything from um, a 99 seat theater up to a 500 seat theater. Uh, but you're guaranteed three productions and that you um, are in residence for 
the first one and usually the second and third one for some amount of time. And what that has done ha has been, it raises the profile of the piece so that they're spinning out much more quickly and uh, people become aware of it because they're seeing the title pop up again and again and that's usually a pretty good way of We're publishing that. two this year that have had Rolling World premieres. Which, from, which, um, Steve Yockey's Afterlife yeah. and um, Bill Missouri Downs. Yeah. The exit interview, which is awesome. Yeah. Which is awesome. Right. So um, that's one of those. That's one of those organizations. If you're not already aware of, as a playwright, you should definitely, you know, get on their mailing list and have a look at their website. Now, one thing that that I've been doing a lot of this year is uh, reading for contests, and that's another good way to get. It's kind of as close to the over the transom sort of thing as you can do with a full length play is by submitting yourself uh, to, and there's a bazillion of them now, uh, and I've read a bazillion plays this year. Um, I mean, I'm, like, I'm on the Artistic Council for the O'Neill, and they put 900 and something plays through their system this year. Those are being read by you know, people all over the country. So that's a good way to get your work out there. It's one of the questions that I've been hearing from people. How do I get somebody to look at my play? Um, and frankly, uh, because, and that's generally why I end up on these kind of panels, is I tend to be frank, um, <laughs> you, you're not going to get someone to look at your play without it getting to the top of the pile in some way. It's why it's so important to develop relationships and so important to not be an ass. Because yeah. we do all talk to each other and we we put it out there and it makes a difference. You want it. You want somebody who you respect to hand you the piece. If I could just check it um, on that point, is I, I think I, I hear from playwrights a lot of, of frustration because they've submitted things and they want it to be looked at and and I, I think all of us would agree that we really would love to look at them and we try to look at everything we can look at and we're trying to find plays and when the connection comes, the opportunity comes, that there's a, like you said, no, don't be an ass. To be a sort of respect for our process and your process. Um, I had a playwright um, a year ago who I met, talked to a little bit, and he's a very nice guy, and he said, can I, can I submit you something, please, please? And I said, you know what, sure. Send it to my email address, I'd be happy to read it. He sent me 24 plays. <laughs> and, and I just politely said to him, I said, thank you, there's no way I can read 24 plays. You know, and it was just my thought was, you know, why did you do that to me? Now, now I can't read your plays anymore. Right. You know, but also, it, I mean, that, it, beyond that I can't read 24 plays, that's really presumptuous. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Respect. Yeah, like, you, yeah. you know, you, uh, you being respectful. And yes, I know it's frustrating, and it's why a lot of us have gone away from the open submission policy, because, you know, we had this conversation earlier this year with American Voices New Play Institute. Um, if you say to people, we will take and read your play. And you have to take and read their play. But a lot of places don't. There are just piles and piles and piles. You could make furniture out of the scripts. And that's where they go. They go in a pile. If they don't go in the trash, they go in a pile. And only when you have an intern who's done something really terrible that need to be punished for, where you say to them, go to the bottom of the pile, and start reading. And honestly, they don't get read that way. So what you want to do is develop a relationship that would allow you to get that script really into mm -hmm. someone's hand, not into the pot. I love when I love when playwrights, local playwrights, come to the theater and see the shows and buy a subscription and support the theater that they want their place to be done in. And I develop a relationship like that, you know? You know, their play, might not, their play might not be the best no. play in the world, but you know what, I'll take interest and I'll be like, okay, well, let's work on it. And I take, I take my year and I help them workshop the play independently, me with them, you know, to, to make sure that they strengthen their, their vocabulary of the play, even, even though I might not produce it, but I give my time to them in that sense, because that's, if I'm not going to produce it, I want to make sure that they get it produced somewhere. That's just me, you know? You know, um, as a producer, I am often looking for a place you know, a theater to develop a play. And it's exactly the same thing. I go to the theaters, right. I'm familiar with their work, I develop a vocabulary, and if I don't know the people who are running the theater, 
you know, I can pick up the phone and call them, but I'm not, I, I make sure that I'm knowledgeable mm -hmm. about the place before just calling and saying, hey, my, I, I have the rights to this play, will you do it? As a matter of fact, um, this summer I am going to visit a few different theaters because I have uh, a play and I'm looking for a home for it. And, um, you know, if you don't show up, you know, you got to be in right. it to win it. Yeah. So it's not that different for me as a producer. It's like I want somebody to pay attention to something that I have. And in order to do that, I've, I've got to go more than halfway. Well, the other thing it allows you to do, you were talking about this in the cover letter. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're just saying, uh, I used to love where I get cover letters that would say, you know, have my name and address on it, and then it would say, Dear Mr. Jory, yeah. because you know, you're, you're, you're just <laughs> churning them out and they haven't paid attention. Um, but if you, if you can say in that cover letter, wow, I just saw your production of Bicycle Country and I loved it and thought it was really special and wonderful and it made me think that you might be interested right. in looking at this play. That's so much better mm -hmm. than Dear Mr. Jory. Yeah. Right? Definitely. So being out there in the world and participating, someone yesterday was talking about how they, writers that don't go see other work. It's like actors who don't go see other people's work. It, you have to be a part of your community. And your community helps you develop those relationships where, like Ricky was saying, even if it's not the right play for him, he I, might I, say, I it on. Right, you know, work on it. I go, wow, it could go, this is not a play for me, but Mixed Blood, Right. Minneapolis would love this place. Send it there with a note. And we've done that several times. Yeah, already. we do it a lot, swapping yeah. around. I think that, I, I just want to add just real quick, something that makes Samuel French kind of interesting with our festival that we do, we're really one of the only publishing companies that host a festival. Yeah. And it's open submissions, and each playwright can submit three plays. Right. And so those three plays yeah. that you submit get two reads by Samuel French staff. And it's nice. really the only time that the Samuel French staff is reading it gets two reads. And we've made a ton of connections. I mean, uh -huh. Gabe McKinley, who just had a show up at Atlantic, yeah. was a festival baby, and we love, and we love him. And <laughs> the thing is, is that we get to hear your voice. Yeah. And there are people who aren't necessarily, they don't get to participate in the festival, but we are interested in them as playwrights. And yeah. we start to watch them right. because mm -hmm. we've become familiar with their work from a 10 to 30 minute play. But, you know, it's it, it, you just have to. Well, yeah. And I would even go, like, just to extend on that idea, most theaters, you know, and, and us as a publisher have, like, a development stage two where they're kind of making those introductions through, mm -hmm. like, Soho Rep has their writer's lab, mm -hmm. and Primary Stages has a reading, and, and to kind of maybe aim for that, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, right. that's a really, really good way for a theater to know your work and kind of build a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. um, we have in addition to the OV Festival, two other contests and festivals, although they're for Canadians and high school students. Um, but we also yeah, have some high school students here, so <laughs> We also have some um, partnerships with major awards where we give like the option to publish to those winners. Right. And so, you know, figuring out which awards maybe come with those kind of introductions um, and, and kind of targeting your work towards those channels. So what I think what we're saying is um, Cultivate the companies that you want to submit to, and then follow the proper procedures. Um, you know, talk to people, find out what they're doing, get it in the right hands. Those blankets, it's like actors that, you know, uh, I think they kind of stop now, but there used to be that and when you finished college, they would say, here, send your picture and resume to all these places. Mm -hmm. Well. Exactly. They go in the garbage. <laughs> they really, they really go in the garbage. And so doing that makes no sense. In fact, it makes me think, wow, why did this kid just waste all this money? Yeah. It's a little better now that you can digitally print your own yeah. pictures. You don't have to go to mass photos. Right. Right. Like, like, give your work to people that you trust, who whose feedback you actually might want to, but who might know someone, so that so that you can. Pass it around, like so that, so that somebody else maybe will hand it to somebody right. that they know. I mean, and it's not it's not about pure manipulation, but if you know somebody who knows somebody, make sure that that person has it and that they they read it and, and if they like it, that they'll they'll pass it on. Or they might be the person to tell you, like, you know what? I know that theater person, and I know that I know that artistic director. He's never gonna like this. Right. So spare yourself. Um, use those connections that you have because 
then, then which essentially is is a, is, a, is like having a good agent. Right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think agents. I mean, agent behavior has changed. Agents don't so sell plays anymore. Well, no. In the digital age, their their work. I mean, the best ones don't do this, but but you know, a lot of agents are, are more passive about how they select the beers that they're submitting work to, and they tend to blanket the world mm -hmm. with submissions, and, and that doesn't. Doesn't mean much. So doesn't mean any more coming from an agent than it does coming from you. Not really. No. He's to do the work as a playwright, anyways. He's got to do all the footwork. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the agent helps with the, the contractual more nowadays. Yeah, you know, the new agents are interested. far more mm -hmm. contract oriented than they are. Like like Morgan Janess is an amazing yeah. old school agent. She new will play. she will grab the play and she will send it to, and like you know make sure that it gets done. And I love that. You know, but she but she. She's hands-on. There's a lot, there's there's a a lot, lot of agents that are hands-on anymore. They're very contractual. Yeah. I, I've always wondered, and maybe, I'm not a playwright, so maybe this is a terrible idea, I apologize. But I've always wondered why <laughs> actors very often will, in, in LA they do this all the time, they'll produce their own shows mm -hmm. to showcase themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I've always wondered why playwrights don't sort of have reading nights publicly of their stuff self-produced more often. We've been talking uh, yeah. about self-producing a lot yeah, this place, weekend. Uh, I think um, the other thing is don't, Actors are very gregarious human beings for the most part. And I know a lot of the stuff that I've produced has come to me from an actor that I know and love. So, you know, use them. They like to read, they like to talk out loud and let people hear them. And, you know, that's, use and they them. Want jobs. And they want jobs. But, yeah, and right. they, if they find a play that they, they know, Leslie was saying, you know, it's got a great role for me in it. Right. You know, so you want to, they want to take it to the directors they know. That's another great way to get your scripts seen by people. Yes? Uh, I was just curious, uh, you know, the, the panel seems to be in, in agreement that the submission system is, uh, I don't know, whatever, broken, whatever you want to call it. Except in a festival situation where I can understand, of course, that that's the whole point. So I wonder why then, uh, does anyone ask why are we doing it then? Like, well, why, why is it necessary? Um, what purpose exactly is it serving? Because I, I've heard for many, many years the same thing. You've got to shake hands with people. You have to build relationships, which makes absolute sense. So wh why do we go on in, with this disingenuous kind of thing like, we had yes, a whole we conference about this, yeah. didn't we? And why not just say, no, build the relationships. Let's go grassroots and let's let's be together in this and, and let's pollinate, cross pollinate each other, blah, blah, blah. It's happening more and more, I think. I think we're going more towards that. More and more theaters are closing their submission, they're changing their submission policies. Um, someone yesterday mentioned, you know, Arena Stage did it and it caused this huge hubbub and everybody was screaming and yelling. and. What it came down to was honesty. Yeah. You know, honestly, we're not going to read your play if you submit it to us in this manner. So, so I think the conversation is opening up about being more honest well, about think, what the procedures really are. Yeah, and the, and the problem is, you're, yeah, I, I, there's much merit in really re, re, theaters looking at what their policies are. The policies, I think, also should be in line with the particular mission of the theater. Right. You know, so it doesn't make sense for the public theater to have a totally closed mission policy because right. of the particular mission that they have. So I think I think that should be part of the rigorous self-examination that the theaters do um, about how they apply their mission in every way. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a it's a broken system that was built with good intentions because most theaters want to believe themselves and to be perceived as being have, being accessible and being ready to receive something that they didn't know they were looking for and that they didn't, they weren't expecting and that there could be somebody out there that they've never heard of who really could come through that way. And I'm sure there are plenty of examples of it. We, I, we I found, <laughs> we, 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 uh, one of our Steinberg nominations was unsolicited. Yeah. Catherine Bush, Just a Kiss. We, you know, I've never heard of her. I read the script and I was like, boom, this is an amazing script. Yeah. And it, you know. Yeah. I mean, some of that, I mean, that's why we keep our, our, our doors open, but I mean, we have to look at it as a new theater because we just, staff-wise, we just can't. And, and, if I, and as a playwright, it's terrible the response time. You're dying. You're like, what are we going to do that letter? I don't care if it's a bad letter. I just want something, and you're dying within. I know. I've submitted my plays in many places. I know how it feels, you know? And, I'm, and when, I, when I read the script, if it comes to me, if it gets to my, to, to my little level, uh, you know, I actually write notes on the script, 
and I set, and if I don't, if I'm not gonna produce it, or if I'm not gonna hand it off, I'll send it back to the player with my notes. You know, but then I get dirty letters from the player. <laughs> <laughs> There's no wedding with you guys. I'm like, you got that for free, you know. <laughs> so I mean, I, we do have to look at ours, uh, but we are starting a new program next season. I think we're gonna change our submission process as well. You know, I just wanted to say something else. I know at the New York Theatre Workshop, there's um, a very active play reading program. Yes. And um, most of the plays, of course, don't get produced there because they only do a certain number a year. And they also have um, a Dartmouth program during the summer where plays are looked at, developed, read. Um, and sometimes people come and they volunteer at the theater. Mm -hmm. And that's another way of establishing relationships. And then mm -hmm. it's, would you take a look at my play and maybe it could be read one night. You know, I'm willing to cast it, direct it, da -da -da -da, you know, bring the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I, mean, I always respond more to people who are proactive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than somebody who says, you know, to me, you know, well, I can't get it done. I, how am I going to get it done? I, you know, now, I mean, I have a career that started with no contacts. I don't, didn't have rich parents. Um, I think my cousin Pearl's cousin was Marty Balsam. <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah. right? Yeah. So, it, yeah. you know, it, it, and I didn't go to a fancy school. I mean, I was just like a... I just said, like, well, I want to do this, and I started a theater company. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you've got to be hungry enough to want to do it, and then when you just feel so frustrated and angry, that's when you turn it upside down and do it, anyway. do it and be positive and be optimistic because nobody is interested in a sourpuss. Mm -hmm. I just want to, I know we have to talk about commissions, but just um, one more thing just off of that comment. Uh, one, one thing that I, I actively like when people submit and keep working on their play while their mm -hmm. play is in submission. Um, I think that some of the stuff that's come through our open door policy or our query policy, um, I've been skeptical of it at first, but then the playwright has shown me over the year so that it's with us that they've really built the market for it. And so I think it's important to remember that even when your play is out with people and pending, that you're still considering you know, you still work on it, and you're still kind of actively trying to build that that network. Mm -hmm. You know, and communicating with people you have it out with about that. So, let's switch to commissions, and we'll we'll do some questions, and when we get past this, um, commissions. Uh, I uh, Florida stage in the twenty it's twenty four years, probably commissioned um, ten or fifteen plays, none of which we ever did. Uh, some of which got done in other places. Um, some of them we were talking about because, mostly because of lack of communication between the um, the organization and the and the writer about what it was that we were looking for. Uh, but it didn't mean that things didn't get right. done in other places. It's a tricky thing because again, it's all about that relationship. I don't know anybody that just hands out random commissions, right? No. no? I mean, maybe there's something, but I don't, I don't think so. So it, it's going to be a theater that you have a relationship with that is commissioning your work. Um, Can I say something about the underlying circumstances of commissions? Yes. Because I think it's something that maybe writers don't think about, um, which is that when, if you want to be a, a theater that commissions playwrights to write things, that means you, you have to raise the money to pay for those commissions, obviously. That is also money that just goes right back out the door again. Mm -hmm. What that means is you have you are dedicating the time and resources of your development staff mm -hmm. to raise money that is not actually fueling the organization in any way. And the reason I say that is because it's not that we shouldn't do it or that, 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 that that's inherently a bad thing, but what it means is uh, it, it frames the experience of how um, precious a resource that commission money is, um, and how much time you can devote to raising money for commissions. <coughs> and so I think that oftentimes clarence are frustrated that the theaters aren't offering more of them, or they're not offering more money, or they're not, 
And in fact, it's, it, it is largely because with cash-strapped not-for-profit organizations, to devote an enormous amount of time and, and human resources to raising money for commissions uh, doesn't make financial sense for the organization. Right. Uh, so that, that's just an underlying Although it is a thing that patrons like to pay for. Yes, they do, which is a good thing. But it's then you are still taking money from a patron, which is not going into the production. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Exactly. It's not going into the general operating. It, right. But it does, a lot of theaters do have programs because it's something their patrons like absolutely, to do. Absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, when you're working with some of our corporate sponsors, for example, at the Atlantic, we've, we've had a, a, we've had a, a very um, healthy relationship with Time Warner, who, which has been very, which has been very generous with us for a time. Part of their gift each year was supporting a couple of commissions on certain parameters that had to do with their own philanthropic guidelines. So we had to commission specific kinds of writers that would align also with the interests of the funding source, right. which is often also the case. Right. So all that to say that, that you know th those are kind of some of the background circumstances in, in which commissions even come to be. Right. Um, but then, but then beyond that, you know, really, they because of that, they really do evolve over time. That, that theaters are very particular and careful about who and how and when they offer a commission. And it's not because they're they're guarding those resources. It's because there's there you want to have an earnest uh, investment in the possibility that this might bear fruit. Um, and it is specifically we're talking about not for profit. Yes. In the commercial world, it's a whole different thing. Commissions don't exist as commissions. They're not. Well, um, I have commissioned a lot of work. Um, I mean, certainly for Mother Out Loud, we commissioned over 40 pieces. Wow. Wow. And it, are those, um, were those done with a, the subject matter, obviously? Yes. They were done with some parameters around them. Well, we would, um, we would agree on a subject matter, uh -huh. you know. So you know, we would approach a writer because we admired um, her work. We have, we, have, we have two male writers in the show, but for the most, it started with women. mostly women. Um, but we didn't say we want you to write a story about X, Y, or Z. Uh -huh. So you know, I would call a writer and say, I read this and I read this and I read this and I like your voice and I am interested in you and this is a project I'm doing and does this interest you? And you know, think about a subject matter that you might like to write about or I might call someone, I mean I did uh, call people and say we're looking for a piece about this subject and we think that you might be able to wrap your brain around it. Are you interested? Um, but I never mapped out a story uh, for anybody. Right. You know. Um, and I did the same thing with standing on ceremony. And you know, oftentimes when you're developing a piece, especially a musical, mm -hmm. um, you know, basically you're hiring a composer, a lyricist, a book writer, and you're kind of commissioning them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I just yeah. didn't think about the term commission being what the term that would. Right. It seemed like you'd be like an advance or a, a poor hire job, which I guess really is what a commission is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you don't have an obligation, but you are paying somebody on the hope of a promise. On spec. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, you guys, John? Um, generally, no, just because the, you know, the, Type the risk is, is too difficult for us. Um, in the last two years, we've actually commissioned two pieces. One was in the show, one was not. And that's we took a shot, and, and they were specific. Yeah. And they were specifically when I knew there was something I wanted in the show that I didn't have. That you didn't have. That's what I did. Right. And then I said, I think this person can give this to me. Can you write this one? That's right. the time I've done it. Yeah. Well, the, only, the only thing I would add to that, and again, this is about relationship building. Um, when, for example, we have gone through the whole submission process and the 800 to 1,000 plays have been read by me. Um, <laughs> there, are often, there are often kinds of plays that 
are, are missing. And I mean, we're, the traditional theater season is a play a month, something to that effect. We essentially do a season in 90 minutes, and it takes us a year to build a season in 90 minutes. Some seasons of summer shorts have been much larger. This is our smallest season of summer shorts, which actually put the pressure on for us. But it has meant that if I didn't, if all I got out of those 800 plays were 600 two-handers, hmm. and of those 600 two-handers, a certain portion of them are about couples in love, or about mothers and daughters fighting, or about whatever. It becomes a question of, well, what elevates this particular play above these other plays about this same idea, if it's an idea that we are interested in? <coughs> right. So when we know that, that there is a play that we have not seen or, or gotten or want, there are a number of friends and family playwrights that we contact and say, is there any possible way you can drum up a 10 minute, six character comedy with music in, I don't know, in two days, in, well, in, 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 in a month. Can you do this? Do you have this in your drawer? And oftentimes, yes, you know what? Some, out, of, out of this 25 or 35 or 45 playwrights, something will come in. And out of those, a few things might be appropriate, mm -hmm. and then they might actually be appropriate to the cast that we've chosen. And then it might be, I'd still hang on to this play for next season, or for another opportunity, or for the tour, but it's because I'm not getting those plays. And one of the things that I hear back from playwrights is, well, nobody wants you know, plays more than than two or three characters. And I say, that might be true for a full length, but it isn't true for a 10 minute play. So think about your genre. You know, think about your genre. When we get these plays, they often don't say, oh, this has to be a white person or a black person or a this or a that. So we have a company that may be all mixed up. And what a lovely opportunity. Mm -hmm. So playwrights have come in and said, geez, I never imagined seeing my play in this way that you've done it, meaning in a good way. But, <laughs> because we've had some that said, oh my God, what did you do to my play? But, um, <laughs> but we've all been there. And so read the guidelines, for example. Our guidelines say that we don't, pub we don't punish pub playwrights. Mm -hmm. So we accept plays that might be a premiere. We accept plays that have been two, done two and three times, four times, because, because those are the hardest productions to get. Yeah. And because in South Florida, frankly, Christine, really? Who else is doing what we're doing? No. Really? No. So it's not like, you know, I could do a revival of something, and we have done revivals mm -hmm. of, of plays we like, but go look at it. Go look at what we're asking for and understand that we go to Samuel French. Mm -hmm. Our relationship now with Samuel French is such that we're trying to be value added to them. And one of the things they get to offer the playwrights who go through their, the whole vetting of their festival is that they say, you know, Suze, do you want to read these galleys of these plays? Because these are going to be the plays that get published in the next collection before they're going to be published, which is how Bedfellows came about. And it's how the student is in the hopper. <laughs> um, but again, it's a two-character play that's a little quirky, and we had quirky with I'll Be There. Right. So uh, just understand that when you're looking at those submission guidelines, and it's really, I think I say it three times, don't send me a full night, don't do it. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's really important everywhere. You know, if, you, if you're sending your new play to a company whose mission is to do you know, 20th century classics, you're, you're wasting your time and your energy. If you're sending a full-length play to a company that only does shorts, plus it makes you look like you didn't do your homework. It makes you look like you're not paying attention. May I add something? To yes. That? Very often, the submission guidelines don't include that kind of information. Yeah. And if they I've don't... Read, I've read a lot of submission yeah. guidelines 
and they don't give me the, the, um, the, the gist of what the theater is about. Right, so that's, a, that's the so beauty I, of having the internet. You can do all that research. What I recommend being on both ends is that you look at the season. Yeah. What they've actually produced, yeah, and they're producing history in their yeah. mission. Uh -huh. They produce uh, ten-minute plays that have six characters in, and you know that your that your work is appropriate if you have a, a seven or eight hander to, to send to them. I mean, it, you know, you've got to uh, we've got to do more research. We've got to do the research. We got to do the hands-on and and see which because if not, you're going to be wasting your money sending a thousand one plays everywhere, I'm and they're never going to get done. Oh, he's just terrible. Yes, that we as playwrights don't mean to grate on the nerves of the... Sure. No, of course not. No, no, we no, 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 want no. to. And we want you to be fabulous. Exactly. I never get up in the morning and say, wow, I hope I read a shitty play today. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, you, you, want, you want everything that comes to you to be like fabulous. Oh, so <laughs> Nobody goes to an audition thinking, boy, I hope I see 300 terrible actors. Yes. Just real quick, kind of t dovetail what you're saying. I've lived in South Florida since 1984, coming from New York. And in New York, there were plenty of resources. Unfortunately, most of them were dead because of the AIDS epidemic. So I'm starting fresh in this environment. And I am going against theaters that only do Oklahoma, 42nd Street. They don't want new works. I live in the city, but you only do shorts, and I write. Well, so help people I'll like me and who are in South Florida who want to find work in South Florida, who want to workshop their work in South Florida before we go back to New York or go to LA. Where do we go? Because the doors are all slammed in our faces and go, we don't do that. We so don't do readings. We so don't produce. do workshops. You have to produce And then to get a place, it's $3,000 a month to rent the place and no one's willing to give you money. I mean, I mean, honestly, in South Florida, real quick, I, I'd be happy to talk about this with you mm -hmm. off the panel. Um, I ran a small theater company that didn't spend three thousand dollars on a show, to be honest with you. So yes. it's doable. That's, that's, what, I'm, that's it, what I'm getting. Got tons of. That's all I'm saying. It is doable, yeah, and actually, we do. Uh, South Florida probably does a ton of, if not, there is a fair amount of new work out here. Yeah. Um, the the I, so thank you. Well, can I, can I, one, one thing that is interesting, I, and this, I'm directing this at Rick because I'm following up on a comment that you made. And I'm saying this not just to suck up because I sent my, my thank you for your <laughs> Seriously, I I read the submission guidelines for new theater, yes. and I and it's very specific. We do these kinds of plays. We also have this kind of series. If you don't hear from us in X time of week, it's because we're very busy, and don't expect to hear from us for a certain period of time. I love that because then I know if I send it to you over a particular time, I know I won't hear from you next week. Right. A lot of I, 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 I want to I want to make sure that that you know. Because I'm a playwright as well, yeah. I, and I, I, I hate to be, you know, booted around. I, 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 I so. run into that more often times than I can count. There was one time when I submitted a play to a theater. I said, I've never heard of this theater before. I'm sure I've never submitted to it. So I read their guide and said, this sounds like a place that would like my play. So I started filling in it, and the email, when I was starting to write the email, the email pops up and says, oh, I've already done this address. And I looked back, and I had done it like four years before, and I never heard from them. But they never promised that they would ever get back to you. So I'm yeah. like, I'll cut them a little slack on that. Yeah, and then people, I think you'll be seeing less and less of that. Uh, right. Yes. Okay, I'm not a playwright, but I'm a director slash actress. Mm -hmm. So jumping off everybody here, I'll be willing to direct a playwright's work. And as far as theaters are concerned, mm -hmm. there's a lot of theaters like, you know, for example, my school has a theater. You know, it's not a, it's not a small you know, mm -hmm. house, it's a big house, but would the local theaters in Miami allow I'm going to throw this something out there. Once a month, um, free open mm -hmm. reading day where playwrights can bring their works, directors, and even student directors that we, that we have. Okay. I don't think I've ever been approached, and I've said no. I, I've approach? figured out, we figured out a way. I go to my board and I'm like, what can we do to house these people? <laughs> We're paying the rent, and I'm not going to charge them anything, you know? Or, you know, it's like we try to figure it out. We try to f help them. So I'm um, saying on a day that's a, that's a dead day, you know, let's say, that, you know, Monday. Yeah, Monday. Dark days. Yeah. Yeah. can we go in there, you know, can we as directors direct one of those playwrights, and on a day that we don't lose money just to get those playwrights out there? I can't say yes, but I can say possibly. Yeah. Uh, we don't own a theater course, anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, you, the artistic directors, come and watch the work. But that, yeah. That, yeah. that's very much a, a relationship question. I, exactly. Joe Adler has readings all, all the time. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I, my other job is at Barry University, and we've brought Alliance Theater Lab has done readings, Conundrum Stage has done readings, and because I've met them, they know me, they ask, we have the day, 
If it's if it's if it's possible, why not? You know, there's I mean, a ton of sure. little companies down here really right are. now too. Mm -hmm. There's a lot yeah. of little companies, and again, that's about being out in your community and making those relationships and meeting those people out over a beer. And you're with an actor, and the actor says, "Hey, do you know this guy? And this guy knows that guy." And but 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 but. If you're suggesting yes. they can buy me a beer anytime. You <laughs> John's up for beer. Yes, John. Hi. Um, uh, speaking on behalf of, I guess, um, I guess student voices in theater, um, being uh, I just graduated from high school, but uh, how how much does necessarily I want to say experience or age play a factor? As in, um, would you be as willing to produce a playwright who's never had a full length produced before, uh, a new work, as opposed to a playwright who has a new work but has had maybe three other works? How much does that play? play it's all about that play. It doesn't matter. Correct. I don't care if you're two. <laughs> if you've written a great play. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. We, just, we just produced a play that by a first a first play by uh, but not a first play, a first full professional production by a writer that's in, in Chris Durant's program at Juilliard and she's twenty six and she's never had been produced before. Um, that's great. It's yeah. exciting. And the, the play is wonderful and, and has a, like a great youthful energy about it and I am, you know, I think it was a really valuable experience for her. We're never going to do a whole season in place like that. Oh, right. You know what I mean? Like, so it is, I mean, yeah, that's right. It is very much about the alignment of the particular play with the tastes and the sensibilities of the theater. And the rest of the season right. and all the things that go into it. I would also, you know, oh, sorry. No, no, all, 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 all I'd say was you know, that play's harder to sell. Yeah. yeah. I would say too that if you're of that age, there are lots of opportunities out there directed especially for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's very, very important like, to learn. It's, like, it's good to keep your hand in both pots just so you're not. But um, to also learn about the specific opportunities for high school age playwrights mm -hmm. or for people getting MFAs or college age playwrights because there's a lot of resources that exist. You know? A lot of competitions. Yeah. A lot of festivals. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, sending those out. Andy. Um, can you just speak to sort of uh, gender and diversity sort of in submission from the process? I know there was the big blow up at the factory recently, and just as you know, as a female playwright, as we have other female playwrights and there's some minority playwrights, just speak to that. And I know you all are very open people, but how how do you not get frustrated as a playwright and just speak to that conflict in general? How do women get the edge, especially women who don't drink? <laughs> <laughs> we do dinner. <laughs> um, I think it's that's again kind of one of those things that's um, about mission for yeah. a lot of producers. You know, if if it is a part of their mission to program diversity, uh, if it if there's a, a part of their mission to make sure that all of those voices get heard, there's some people. You know, if you're doing modern you know, 20th century classics, you're probably not going to be as interested in that as if you're doing, do you guys look at at gender when you yeah, are? Yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> part of, I mean, part of that really, I mean, as society continues to change, that will get better, but it also is a matter of trying to change society a little bit and trying to push. I mean, Chris DiPaolo is a friend of mine, and um, this is an issue that's been very heavily on his mind, and so he has sort of brought that up to me and to uh, circumstances I've been around enough times that it makes me think about it more. Right. And, and we do, we actually did. I, I actually don't look at the playwrights' names when I read plays, to be perfectly honest with you, because I, I want to read the play. Um, I, I actually don't learn the playwrights' names until I decide I like the play. Yeah. I mean, that's just honestly. A lot, of, a lot of people um, read the line. But we, I do, we, I do ha I have begun to factor that in. Um, and I think everyone has to begin to make those factors. And what we have to do now is go. I am so sorry, but it's, they're giving me the high sign from every corner. <laughs> Here's the deal. You have from now until 5.45. Till Bar open now. <laughs> <laughs>